Welcome to this interview organized by the EU Turkey Civic Commission about the Permanent People's Tribunal on Turkey and the Kurds, which was held in March 2018 in Paris. The tribunal, established in Bologna in 1979, is a permanent institution that aims to give recognition, visibility, and a voice to the people's suffering violations of their fundamental rights. Victims who, according to the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Peoples, proclaimed in Algiers in 1976, were marginalized in international law, which had increasingly become the guarantor of the interests of the public and private holders of political and economic powers. So far, the PTT has delivered judgments in 74 cases. The Permanent People's Tribunal is built around an international network of experts, social actors and scholars from several countries of Europe, South America, Asia and Africa, recognized for their independence and competence. Two of those experts are with us for this interview, Philippe Texier and Gianni Tognoni. Philippe Texier, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We are honored to have you. Tekshe is president of the Permanent People's Tribunal. He is an honorary judge at the Cassation Court of France. He was a member of the Committee of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights from 1987 to 2008 and its chairperson from 2008 to 2009. He was director of the Human Rights Division of the UN Mission in El Salvador from 1991 to 1992, and an independent expert of the Human Rights Commission in Haiti from 1988 to 1990. Also a warm welcome to Gianni Tornoni, a medical doctor by profession. Dr. Gianni Tornoni is the secretary general of the Permanent People's Tribunal since its establishment in 1979. Over the last decades, Dr. Tognoni has been deeply involved in the promotion of humans and people's rights, beginning with his participation in the Russell Tribunal on Latin American dictatorships in the 1970s, and in the preparation of the Universal Declaration uh, of People's Rights. Lentry, let me introduce myself too. My name is Frederike Geerdink. I've been a journalist since 30 years. I was based in Turkey and Kurdistan between 2006 and 2020. I'm specialized in the Kurdish issue. During the tribunal on Turkey and the Kurds, I served as a witness and testified about the bombing of Kurdish border traders in 2011, which I investigated. The tribunal focused on war crimes and state crimes committed against the Kurds. The war crimes were committed in the period between the 1st of June 2015 and 31 December 2017 in several cities in southeast Anatolia, where the majority of inhabitants were Kurdish. The state crimes concerned bombings, assassinations or kidnappings committed since 2003 in Turkey and abroad against representatives of the Kurdish movement, their press organs and institutions. As I remember, the tribunal in Paris in March 2018 was experienced by those participating as a milestone on the road to holding Turkey responsible for the crimes it committed against its Kurdish citizens. I would like to ask both of you what you consider to be the most important results of the session in Paris in 2018. And Mr. Texier, I uh, would like to start with you. Could you give us your perspective? Yes. Thank you so much for this interview. Like we heard from many uh, eyewitnesses in 2018. 
one of the essential elements. It's the denial of the auto-determination auto -determination rights of the Kurds. By imposing the Turkish identity and uh, forbidding the, their mother tongue and public spaces. And also uh, by uh, hindering their participation in the economical and political life of society. Because uh, uh, this participation was uh, seen as a menace or a threat to the to the Turkish uh, state's uh, authority. And uh, the Turkish uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan always used the term terrorist when he was talking about the Kurds and uh, about the Kurdish people. Like we said uh, in the conclusion of the tribunal, and uh, the facts were uh, given by the numerous uh, eyewitnesses. And uh, as by the starters of the tribunal, we were given a time for, uh, of two years from the beginning of 2015 until the beginning of 2017. There were two kinds of crimes that were uh, detected or which were determined. First was the, the war crimes. especially the, the military confrontations in the southwest of uh, Anatolia. Southeast, we should say. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, which were also uh, marked by uh, large displacements uh, of populations and not just military actions, deportations. Uh, the goal was clear. It was uh, clearly uh, uh, the aim was clearly to physically remove a part of the Kurdish uh, population to physically get rid of the Kurdish population. The second type of crime that was uh, that was mentioned was the the, the state crimes. Uh, like like uh, assassinations, uh, extrajudicial uh, the disappearances, and the, est que vous pouvez répéter le troisième? And uh, uh, people who were uh, forcibly removed from society. The Turkish state and the Turkish state and its police forces and its secret services, uh, they were not only active on uh, Turkish territory, but also uh, on territory outside of Turkey. Uh, like in France, uh, three Kurdish uh, activists, uh, women activists uh, were uh, assassinated in Paris. And uh, we can say that there were no clear or active investigation or serious active uh, 
serious investigations regarding the role of the Turkish forces. Uh, one of the conclusions of the tribunal was that uh, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the Turkish president, uh, had a direct responsibility to these actions. Uh, uh, the po uh, police and uh, military forces used uh, uh, extreme measures against uh, the militants fighting them, but not. Uh, and what's even uh, more horrible is the what they used against the Kurdish population itself. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we also uh, mentioned the responsibility of General Uduti, uh, General of the Turkish uh, forces, who also had a big responsibility in the actions. Uh, who or actually ordered a, a cooperative uh, action between police forces, uh, military and uh, militias. This was a short resume of the three main points of the of the People's Tribunal, which were uh, proven by uh, evidence, facts, and also by uh, witness statements and necessary documents. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Tognoni, um, I wanted to ask you the same question, at the, and at the same time, I was wondering, with, with all your experience um, with this tribunal, um, what, what drew your attention in this, in this um, session about Turkey and the Kurds? Was it, um, <clears throat> were there things that you didn't know about the, about the, the way that Turkey is treating its, uh, its Kurdish citizens? Yes. Um, I, I think that uh, the, two, the two questions could be closely related, I will start for the first one, uh, because I think that uh, the key points which have been made by Philippe Texier, uh, which uh, show clearly the role of the tribunal to uh, transform uh, a situation, uh, the position of the Turkish state against the Kurd, which uh, so far was uh, and somehow still is part of the general chronicle as something which is happening without anybody taking a formal position for the qualification of those facts. So the Permanent People Tribunal, according to what you were saying, uh, was the first uh, instance where some facts were not left as facts. They were analyzed very clearly with a good, very strong combination of uh, factual evidence and for the qualification for the juridical point of view as a something which could not uh, uh, enjoy the impunity of the silence, first of all, because uh, the role of Turkey over the years, even more after the coup of the 2016, is in fact something which is uh, uh, observed from outside. Nothing is uh, declared formally, not only illegal for the violation of human rights internally and for the general situation, 
But in fact, it is accepted by the international public opinion and no real measure are made as if, and that was one of the points of so for the tribunal, as if the problem also of the Kurds could be considered simply a kind of uh, internal problem with no uh, accountability with respect to the principle of international law and with the respect of uh, basic rights of the people. In that sense, uh, the tribunal, uh, according to your uh, tradition and role, was able, and Philippe Texier was clearly showing that, that uh, those facts were in fact a formal expression of a very direct uh, political decision. They were not occasional events uh, which could be considered as uh, a sum of facts. That was a very clear decision of the policy. The fact uh, of uh, denouncing that and showing that in a formal tribunal, because the People's Tribunal is not simply a symbol, is the fact of uh, declaring that in that in the absence of uh, an international court, uh, the peoples have the duty of raising the real issues which are not allowed to be raised in international forum. That was at the end, uh, at the origin of the tribunal. The tribunal cannot accept the fundamental crime of silence in front of what should not be allowed in a civil society. And all what has been testified and qualified by experts and testimonies, you were one of them, you were saying, and in that sense, uh, the tribunal says that uh, the visibility is the first way of judging the crimes. Crimes do not yeah. remain hidden and unrecognized. And in that sense uh, is on one side, a clear judgment also for the future with respect to the Turkish responsibility is a clear contribution to the identity of the Kurdish people yeah. They are not simply a minority which could be disregarded as an internal problem, is a yeah. recognition of the identity, which is the main point which is denied on that sense. From the point of view of what you were saying, we could go on, but then uh, we could possibly go on also for other questions. But for the second point, I think with respect to the uh, other session of the history of the tribunal, uh, certainly we have found uh, other cases which could have some similarities. But first, uh, uh, I think that in this situation, the fact of uh, raising in Paris, in Europe directly, a problem for Turkey, which uh, was and is one of the key problem also for the European society, because the role of Turkey is a very critical, more than ambiguous role in Turkey. And this is an open question posed to the European Union. Turkey, uh, not only for the Kurdish, is in fact uh, formally violating the basic rules uh, which should be respected in for, the, for being considered part of Europe. She, uh, Turkey is not yet, obviously, and hopefully will not be part of Europe, but at least uh, there is a clear clarification. We had uh, in the history of the tribunal another situation which was not strictly directed against uh, the Turkish state in the same form because we had a tribunal on the Armenian genocide. And we remember very well that at that time also there was a strong opposition also from the European government, the French government, because they were saying that Turkish could not, Turkey cannot be in fact uh, touched or accused of being a criminal state because uh, a state which is committing crime is a criminal state. 
and is something which was uh, growing as evidence because uh, we could possibly discuss later that because Turkey has become, uh, while repressing so dramatically the Kurdish inside, has become also one of the protagonists of the migration policy of the of Europe, mm -hmm. because that is something which could be discussed later, but it's important to raise a problem of the role of a state and a role of the relationships of the other states with a criminal state which does not accept even to recognize the basic principle. And every time it is accused for something, possibly the oppression is increased. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we could go on, but I think that for the purpose of having more living discussion, if you prefer, I could go on. Otherwise, you ask other questions that we could expand for yeah. other problems which have been touched uh, in the session. Yeah, yeah. You 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 already make it a little bit uh, political, isn't it? I wasn't sure if I was going to go on that road, but it is political, isn't it? How how do you how do you see your how do you think about your, your role in this way? Like, do you look at it purely in a judicial way? Obviously not, because... No, but uh, I think that uh, Philippe Texier, who is a magistrate, is better than I am as a doctor. But I think that at the end, uh, international mm -hmm. law is by definition something which has a political impact. The facts uh, which are judged as uh, an expression of the political accountability. And if the political accountability is in fact uh, substituted by the denial of the facts and the qualification of the fact as an internal, purely internal matter without recognizing the identity of the other, that is a violation of the fundamental rights and the respect of fundamental rights is in fact uh, an essential component of the legitimacy of a political behavior. Mm -hmm. Otherwise would be as if you declare that uh, you can't uh, uh, kill somebody and somebody is killing, but then is killing and therefore that has real implication because the state should be the guarantor of the life of the citizen to find the solution for the problem, while in fact it becomes the enemy of its own population. The Kurdish are not invisible, they do exist. And in fact, uh, the uh, non-recognition with the violence, the bombing, everything, that those people are not citizens but are an enemy, is a clear political action. So we qualify that juridically, strictly juridically, but recognizing that the juridical judgment coincides with a political implication. We are not saying that he's wrong in his policy. We say that its policy is criminal and is in fact killing real people. They are not simply threatening something. They are really destroying towns, bombing. Everything is in a real war, and they yeah. cannot call that a kind of, say, internal measure to maintain the order. But I think that possibly Philippe uh, Texier could expand uh, because uh, he's yeah. also obviously at the main border between uh, the juridical side and the political implication. Yes, exactly, because those are strong words like the, the the state of turkey is actually becoming or has become the the enemy of its of its citizens of its kurdish citizens um would you put it um just as strongly mr texier or would you phrase it differently how do you how do you look at that as a as a judge I'm not sure I understood everything, but I got the, essent the essentials.
Yeah, we can say without any doubt, of course, that the decision or the or the result of the people's uh, permanent people's tribunal is a is a political uh, one. But which one, which judi judicial uh, declaration isn't a political one? What we have to underline is that, uh, like Johnny said before, is uh, why was this tribunal uh, held? Uh, because uh, there was no any uh, platform or any other uh, uh, situation where the question of the Kurdish people in Turkey was uh, discussed and which, uh, uh, which had a judicial uh, ex explanation. Neither United Nations, neither the uh, uh, United Nations uh, Human Rights Committees, uh, neither the European Union. The Turkish uh, foreign minister uh, plays his role really well, and uh, he uh, keeps threatening Europe uh, with the uh, with the possibility of opening up the the borders to let in all the possible refugees which are in Turkey right now, which could uh, which would, uh, which would uh, then travel to Europe, of course. And uh, it's that constant threat threat that he's using uh, to undermine. Uh, uh, every other decision. Of course, uh, of course, there's also the, the intervention of the Turkish army in the northeast of Syria. Uh, it's actually uh, a little bit uh, double-faced towards their own people because they are the, the, the population of Turkey because they are intervening there and then creating refugees that come to Turkey. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Danny said, Jani referred to the Armenian genocide. There's a there's a, a, a constant in, in Turkey, which is the the denial of the of minorities in, in Turkey, or, or actually maybe we could say other people. The, the denial uh, of other people is a constant in Turkish politics, and uh, like Jani said, uh, he gave the example of the Armenian genocide. That's uh, what he, uh, Mr. Tixi, what yes. he wants to. It's interesting that you both uh, both mentioned the, the way that Europe is um, is complicit in a way also by um, allowing Turkey to have this power over Europe's borders by by the actually by the the European fear of refugees, um, but that was of course not part of the part of the session in in two thousand eighteen, but. I find it remarkable that you both mentioned it, and, and Europe is complicit then, in a way. Would you, would you phrase it like that? Mr. Tornoni, maybe? You are still muted, yeah. Sorry. Um, I think that the, the tribunal follow, and I think the Philippe Texier will integrate it, uh, the tribunal follow closely 
som rules. We are judging something which is part of the acquisition. In order to be ready uh, to uh, consider clearly the relationship, if any, between the accusation, the facts, uh, and then the qualification. In that sense, the uh, specific role of uh, Europe in that sense uh, was not part, uh, explicit part uh, of yeah. the uh, mandate uh, of the tribunal. So whatever judgment uh, could really risk uh, to damage uh, the rigor of the qualification with respect to the direct responsibility of the Turks. But as uh, Philippe was saying, it is clear that uh, uh, if we have a broader view, the fact of uh, having a judgment which qualify the Turkish state as a criminal state uh, with respect uh, to the you know, compliance with the rules of law, which should be qualified Europe, is certainly uh, documenting a uh, kind of complicity, connivance, whatever, because uh, uh, the problem which has been raised uh, uh, is not uh, recognized, uh, is not included in the agenda of Europe. So yeah. the European Union, in this sense, uh, has adopted a tradition which is a very bad tradition from the point of view of a European citizen, besides being secretary of the Permanent People's Tribunal, of simply ignoring the facts or declaring that there is not a direct competence on that fact. And in that sense, uh, to find a way of avoiding to respond to the tribunal. If I mention in that sense, uh, the position of the tribunal with respect to Europe in the case of migration, in that, in that case, we have specifically adopted the combination of the accusation of what was the responsibility of states. We have made various sessions to migration in Italy, in France, in Spain, in UK okay. before Brexit. And then in a general uh, recent uh, verdict in Berlin. In that, in that context, both the national responsibility and the European policy were included in the framework of the accusation. And yeah. both accusations were proved with direct act of Europe, the fact of Europe in that sense for migration, with respect to the request, the evidence that the Dublin agreement is in fact violating formally the right of the people on migration, the fact that Europe in front of that says, we do not change anything in the Dublin, which is recognized as a source of violation. It is yeah. clear that our verdicts are clearly a verdict of formal responsibility of the European Union. And in that sense, obviously also the role of Turkey is included because also in the general management of the migration issue in Europe, yeah. as people were saying already before, Turkey with the support of Europe, but a support which is not a formal support. It's mm -hmm. a support uh, which go through simply economic support exactly. and it's not a political decision. So this situation is clear, very confused, it's planned to be confused in order yeah. to have the idea of the complexity or the ambiguity are a reason for not declaring the competence or the responsibility. Yeah. And in that sense, uh, I think that we feel, we, I feel, but I think that, that it would be a very important responsibility of Europe really to consider, but uh, Europe has not only Turkey for different situations, other countries declare who are part of Europe, declare they are not respecting fundamental human rights and civil liberties. So Europe is really, because also of the position of Turkey, going through a very 
ambivalent period, Turkey was a candidate to be yeah. part of the Union. That has been dropped. Uh, nobody could today imagine. There are also other problems, which, however, were not uh, part uh, of the specific uh, target of the tribunal in Paris. We could discuss about the military alliance and something like that, but that is really would be a political situation, could be part of another tribunal, but yeah. we tried to stick clearly to the mandate uh, and facts were convincing enough uh, to declare all the responsibility of the Turkish state. Yeah. But um, I, was, I was reading into the results, of course, again, and what strikes me is that on the one hand, um, the, the war crimes and the state crimes of Turkey were put in a historical and a geopolitical perspective. Um, and, and it was explicitly said that the Turkish Republic has never really respected the right, uh, rights of its Kurdish citizens, even since the foundation of the state, even in 1923, um, and that the core of the problem is that the Kurds are denied their right to self-determination. But at the same time, one of the conclusions was that President Erdogan is directly responsible for the war, war crimes and state crimes committed, um, in particularly in the cities in Southeast Anatolia between 2015 and 2017. Um, and I was, I was wondering how, why is it judicially so important to narrow the responsibility down to one person, in this case, President Erdogan? Um, and, and if you do that, doesn't, doesn't it also disregard the larger problem? How do you, how do you find a balance between those two? Um, Mr. Tekshe, could you, could you start answering this question? Euh, je, je traduis pour vous. Euh, Madame Girding a, a dit que Of course, the, the problem is just is larger than just Erdogan, but we're talking about a period uh, where he is uh, president about those two years. Crimes against humanity or state crimes. We have to find a responsible person. The, the the tribunal has, uh, has, uh, has concluded and has constant uh, has uh, seen that the, the 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 crimes are a result of political decisions. So we have to uh, we have to look at it that way. So when the when the tribunal has observed that uh, Erdogan is responsible uh, because of the political decisions and is added towards the, the Kurdish people, uh, 
like if we look at the processes as, that has been done in Nuremberg, a certain number of responsible persons were uh, judged upon. Of course, the principal uh, responsible person, Hitler, wasn't there anymore. What I just want to say is, declaring a principal responsible of this uh, cr uh, of, of these crimes uh, it doesn't render uh, it, uh, the larger picture any less important it's uh, but it has it's something that judici judicially has to be done yes it was the uh, second part of your question. What was the first part of your question again? Um, no, this this answers the question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, and now uh, the tribunal is almost uh, almost three years ago now, and um, it's of course a deep wish of many Kurds and friends uh, of the Kurds to take those responsible for war crimes, also some of the military uh, officers that have been named, um, so, some of them responsible for the war crimes and the state crimes, to take them to, to court, to official court. Um, how can the tribunal on Turkey and the Kurds serve as a milestone on the way to, for example, the International Criminal Court? Uh, Dr. Uh, Tohnoni, maybe I can start with you? Yeah, uh, certainly uh, the, the answer to your previous question was already in that direction. Uh, according to the international law, uh, the criminal responsibility is, must be more or less always a kind of also an individual responsibility. Yeah. But in that sense, uh, we could say that uh, the real ambiguity uh, is not so much in the Permanent People Tribunal with respect to the politics, but in the International Criminal Court. Because in order to be taken to the International Criminal Court, which should be competent in those crimes, uh, requires uh, uh, many steps. Uh, the fact of uh, having signed uh, the Rome Statute of the Criminal Court, uh, the fact of having the permission of the Security Council. So the, the step towards uh, the uh, International Criminal Court uh, is not so easy yeah. because of political reason. So yeah. I think that it was interesting in that sense uh, to mention that uh, in a different context, uh, with uh, the tribunal, we had uh, two sessions uh, of the Permanent People Tribunal on the ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, the uh, International Criminal Court was still, uh, you know, an idea because the, uh, the state was in 1998. The criminal facts and the genocide were happening before. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tribunal had the two sessions, one in Bern and the other one in Barcelona with judges who were then sitting also in some international criminal court. In that sense, the tribunal was really substituting, anticipating what was clear enough from the facts. There was no doubt mm -hmm. there were personal responsibility. Though Milosevic and the other were also expression of a clear geo political situation, the intervention of the NATO, the state, so all the, really the complex situation. But mm -hmm. in the situation, we were uh, really the first ones who declared that those people had to be the dictators, or Milosevic and then uh, the Kurt, uh, should be really judged. When the court, uh, or the ad hoc tribunal of Yugoslavia was established. In fact, uh, I remember the first session, there were observators of those who were preparing the International Criminal Court who came to Bern to see how we were proceeding 
in order to evaluate uh, crimes which were not uh, classical crimes. Clearly, yeah. uh, Hitler also was a dictator, then there were many executors, but those who were really running the play were in fact uh, those uh, semi-dictator or whatever the name you could have. And in that sense, uh, the People's Tribunal is always, uh, first of all, centered on the victims. The tribunal says that whatever is the possibility of the criminal courts uh, which exist or do not exist in the world, our duty is declared that those victims are not, uh, in fact, neither enemy, neither terrorist, they are the real judges of the criminals. They we give back the role of judges because the victims are those who are in fact the subjects of law. They are the true representative of the peoples, not those who are the power. Certainly, we enter here in a situation which is. Uh, not directly always recognized in the formal international law, which is true, but even the international law you were asking us is in fact trying to evolve in order to recognize that uh, as it is now, the international law uh, leave many, many component of the society which are not covered by the protection of law. And in that sense, uh, the decision of the tribunal since the beginning was uh, the role of giving at least uh, to people their, uh, their rights and uh, declare that uh, even if uh, the criminal law internationally give impunity in the formal way, we cannot uh, give impunity, which would mean that the victims, in fact, uh, do not exist. Yeah. Because uh, impunity is as if uh, something says uh, nothing has happened. The yeah. tribute and uh, Philippe Texier was one of the key person in that sense after the dictatorship in Latin America, which were judged during the Russell Tribunal, we had a very important session on impunity. The session was a, a series of sessions in different states uh, of Latin America, recognizing that after the dictatorship, there was not a tribunal to judge the dictator. Dictators were just closed for political reasons. But there was this vacuum and the tribunal assumed the role of uh, having a session against impunity as the very critical violation of the duty of the law. And in fact, the work of the tribunal, thanks also to Philippe Texier, became really for the first time a chapter of international law. And now impunity is part of a duty which should be really respected by international law. In order to leave, not to leave, uh, we are uh, in these days uh, spectator of what goes on in Myanmar. In Myanmar, we declared also a genocide, nobody was claiming it was a genocide. Now, everybody says that it is a genocide. Yeah. The criminal court is possibly declaring its competence, but there are many other reasons. In the meantime, obviously, it is important that the visibility of the truth of the victims, at least, uh, should be respected. And in that sense, uh, is, in fact, the role of the tribunal. But, but this is a very interesting answer also um, because what what Kurds would really like is to see Erdogan and other people responsible being judged in an official court. But when I listen to you, um, 
the People's Tribunal is actually more grounded in what law, international law should really be about. It should be about the victims, about the citizens who are the judges. So are they wrong to strive for um, strive for Erdogan to face like official judges in an official court? Is it shouldn't shouldn't the movement strive for that? But uh, you know, I, I think that uh, possibly Philippe will say something in that sense. But I think that uh, it is clear that uh, from the point of view of the responsibility of Erdogan, Turkey, and especially with respect to the right to self-determination of the Kurdish people, mm -hmm. the situation is even more complex because uh, we have concentrated because of the acquisition of the Kurdish of the Turkey. But as you were saying before, and in the verdict, we were already mentioning that the situation was evolving with respect to Syria, to Rojava, to all what happened in Afrin and so on. And that is something which is, in fact, uh, something which uh, today uh, cannot find a response uh, in the juridical order. We should go back to the main division, but now it is clear that that region of the world uh, is a kind of, say, laboratory of all the contradictions between uh, criminal behavior, economic crimes, uh, geopolitical situation. And again, the bad, bad, bad things is that the Kurdish people in Iraq or in Syria, in Rojava, in Afrim, the women are in fact uh, those who are left aside as if uh, their fate is to be victims instead of being uh, real people we should be adopted at least uh, by the civil society of Europe, not simply for solidarity, but as a real model of what should be democracy. And yes. that is the real, say, crime of the international society, to leave aside what could and should be a way of inventing democracy today in such a bad situation and instead, uh, the situation is left there, and people are again yeah, sold to the first enemy, which yes. could have an interest to show that is very strong. But um, I'm sure that uh, Philippe could say something more yes. size or specific in that sense. Yes, Mr. Tekshe, the floor is yours. You, if you could react to um, to this. I think the role of the, of the tribunal, uh, as was mentioned, uh, is uh, against impunity. I think uh, the People's Tribunal, which is non-coercitive, uh, offers the victims the possibility to, uh, to search for their rights uh, because in the, in the tribunals or in the arenas uh, who, who are coercizing, they cannot find that, uh, they cannot find their rights. They cannot find their, uh, what is necessary as a victim. There's that aspect. Uh, it gives the, the, the victims the chance to, uh, 
to, to give their demands to uh, uh, to, uh, ex uh, to exercise the right to to, to uh, express themselves in the proper arena. The tribunal uh, has an added value, which I strongly believe in, in uh, that it uh, helps uh, evolve the, the international law. Just an example. For example, the crimes of uh, forced uh, uh, disappearances. Tribunal has had many sessions regarding this forced uh, disappearances, so, for example, in the Latin America and, uh, for example, in Argentina, etc. And in numerous uh, constitutions, this crime was actually not even recognized. And after a long uh, uh, work of uh, militants of, uh, of human rights law, the convention of the forced disappearances was, was adopted. Now there is a, a committee uh, who can advise or help uh, national uh, legislation on these forced disapp uh, disappearances. They can uh, help them evolve in a positive way regarding this crime. And that's all due to the, peop uh, to the People's Tribunal. Uh, this, this this decision, which was done in in 2017, maybe it doesn't have a coercive uh, power of decision, but it uh, certainly adds uh, some uh, some possibilities for the Kurdish people. Thank you. Okay. Um... I would like to I would like to end uh, this interview with with a question for very concrete steps that um, Kurds could take. Um, I always have in the back of my mind that there's of course an international court, there's a people's tribunal, there are also domestic courts in Turkey. Um, a few steps need to be taken, of course, before Erdogan will stand trial in a domestic court in Ankara. That, that would be something. Um, but wherever he ends up or does not end up uh, facing, facing an official uh, judge in an official court, what's, what kind of concrete steps could the Kurds and the Kurdish movement take um, to, to hold those responsible um, accountable after this session at the, at the People's Tribunal? What, as concrete as possible, could you sort of give some advice, so to speak? Mr. Mr. Tofnani, maybe yes, you can start. Okay. Uh, I think that some of the uh, recommendations which are made in the verdict go in that direction. Uh, I think that because uh, the probability of having uh, uh, Erdogan or the general taken to the International Criminal Court uh, is something which is up in the air, certainly. It should be. But in order to give that, I think that the main recommendation of the tribunal was coherent with the overall general approach. Everything should be done concretely. And I think that in European Union or something like that, 
in order to create uh, minimal conditions for uh, allowing a democratic opposition in Turkey. I think that the recognition of the right of the Turkish people to go back and have an Ocalan free and so on, I think those things are those who are recognizing that the Turkish people, the, not only the Kurds, the Kurdish people with the Kurds uh, yes. must be a people capable of uh, being in opposition. And in that sense, I think that a formal support of this identity under the pressure of European people of Europe, I think that could be important. I think that uh, obviously if nothing is done against the really the dictatorship of Erdogan by Europe and Erdogan is left free of doing whatever, the opposition is obviously in great difficulty. And in that sense, so, so the Kurdish. Second, I think that in order to uh, support the, also the internal Kurdish people, I think that uh, it would be good to create uh, in Europe along the same line, the idea that the overall situation of the Kurd people should be taken as a critical issue for the peace in the area. We cannot separate again, because that would be the weakness of the Turkey people, the internal Kurds and then the women in Rojava and the other thing. Because otherwise, each of them could become an even weaker minority. And the public opinion continue to consider that the fate of Kurds is of being victims. While in fact, I think that we have to reconstruct concretely. And I think that you are a journalist. I think one of the big point uh, is uh, really to give back uh, the visibility of the Kurdish issue in the general public opinion in order to see that we are not simply fighting against dictators or enemies of the Kurds. We are fighting for the visibility and the right of existing of Kurdish people because we respect uh, the culture, the tradition, everything. And we know that if uh, the Kurdish issue is not solved, our real civil identity also means is violated because uh, we cannot be near people who are violated without uh, being in fact uh, violated in our responsibility for defending them. Very good, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tekshe, what, what would be your answer to, to the question, what concrete steps can be taken now on the road ahead? really difficult because the state of justice, the, the position it is in right now internally in Turkey is a, it's a, it's a disaster. The one has uh, incarcerated a, a huge number of judges, Uh, journalists, uh, academic, academics, uh, teachers, uh, a lot of people who had to uh, leave their jobs. The fight is really concrete. Because the, because the, the fight to return uh, to democracy is not only a fight of the Kurds, but also a fight of the what the Turkish people should support. Yes. We have to reinstate the, the right of free, freedom of press, the freedom of expression.
uh, we can we can uh, imagine that one day that this will uh, come in front of an international tribunal and when i mean a tribunal like that that can that has courses of uh, power that can uh, really uh, uh, judge and uh, obviously we are far from that right now but uh, i think one day this can happen yes thank you thank you that's that's um very very insightful very valuable and very outspoken also that's it's very it's very clear and very very educational also thank you both very much um it's very important to reflect on uh what we've done three years ago and how we can take the findings uh further into the future mr texier and uh dr tognoni i would like to thank you both very much for joining us uh, from France, from Italy, we highly appreciate your contribution and your insights. To the audience, I would like to say thank you for watching and for showing an interest in the plight of the Kurds. Thank you very much for your attention.